Harriet, welcome to the show. Oh, I'm delighted to be with you. You know, it's so good to have someone who has such a, uh, not only academic background, which is your PhD, which I love that, but also I think in your book, Marriage Rules, you've done a phenomenal job of really taking some, I, I would say, very practical approach to how to, how to have a great marriage. And uh, so today, I wanted to take some time to just understand how do we make marriages work? Um, and I, I really think your approach has been common sense. And um, maybe if you can elaborate on, uh, in your book, you say that marriage, making marriage work often comes back to common sense and being motivated to have a better marriage, which sounds simple. And uh, can you elaborate? Well, it sounds simple, but putting something into practice is not simple at all. And it does, I mean, in a way, we all know the things we need to do to have a better marriage. We know that marriage, um, that, that we need to make the other person feel special and valued and chosen. And we know that we love people who make, ourse- who make us feel good about ourselves. So we know that it's important to warm things up and help our partners to feel good about themselves. And, you know, there's a whole list of things that we already know. But putting them into practice in marriage is really difficult. And so many of us treat our dry cleaner, you know, better than than we treat our partner. So motivation, um, motivation to have a better marriage is really important because we're all motivated to change, but we don't want to change first. We want our partner to change, and that, of course, is a recipe for relationship failure. So it is really important that we have the motivation to change our own self and to be willing to experiment with new behaviors rather than trying to fix up our partner. It makes sense. I mean, I think the idea of uh, if only my partner would change, we'd have a better marriage is oftentimes the uh, beginning stage of a lot of relationships. And when it gets into crisis and they're feeling tension and conflict, how do you motivate yourself to move towards that? Is it based on pain? Is it kind of a pain threshold as that goes up? People are more... Uh, willing to look inside, to look at themselves and say, you know what, I probably need to make some adjustments here. Or what have you found that generally causes that motivation for someone to take their eyes off their partner trying to change them and more or less say, how do I change? It's really a universal problem because I would say that every couple that has ever come to see me for therapy or counseling is secretly hoping that I'm going to fix up their partner. And it can take a lot of work to help someone get self-focused and to experiment with new behaviors themselves. And sometimes, like you're saying, Noel, sometimes pain uh, is a good motivator. That change is always scary. And sometimes you have to be in enough pain that you overcome your resistance to change. And by the way, we're wired, you know, humans are wired when we're anxious and stressed <clears throat> to blame the other person. Mm-hmm. You know, we're wired for fight or flight. So under stress in marriage, and I don't need to tell our listeners that they'll always be stress. Under stress, you'll see a fight or flight response in marriage, meaning if it's a flight response, People very quickly become distant or one partner becomes distant and won't talk about things that really matter. Or you see a fight response. And under stress, couples will quickly become polarized. They'll be over-focused on what their partner's doing wrong and under-focused on our own creative ways to move differently in the relationship So, you know, this is normal, and, you know, I think you really are right on, Noel, in saying that sometimes, you know, you just need to be in enough pain that you're willing to get more self-focused. 
Yeah. Well, and I think we, we would strongly suggest if you're listening, don't let it be pain that motivates you. Uh, because I think that though that is one factor to help move you towards change, um, ultimately we find that couples who are proactive and saying, hey, how, how can we continue to work on your, our relationship? It really begins to help create a solid foundation. I think one of the things I love about your book is that literally you can open it to any page and you have a rule that would be fitting for a couple to take in and consider. And I know for a lot of our listeners, one of the things that we get from them is the problem with communication. Can you share with us some marriage rules related to criticism? Well, criticism, interestingly, I don't know if you've found this, Noel, it's more frequently a complaint of men. Women's complaints in marriage are more frequently, I feel alone in this relationship, I can't reach my partner, my, my feelings don't affect my partner, um, he's distancing too much, and very often the man feels that there's just nonstop criticism and he's not appreciated. They're, they're not enough, um, you know, there's not enough praise and that the criticisms are, you know, too much is actually what I hear most frequently from men. And I think that if you're the one you know, man or woman, if you're the one who is critical, that you just need to dial it down and you need to warm things up and to make it a point to keep a good ratio between the positive and the negative comments. Um, Research shows that a five-to-one ratio between positive comments and critical ones will save any marriage. And I don't think it needs to be five to one. I think it can be, you know, three to one. Um, Pay attention to criticisms and not just criticisms, but little corrections. We may not even mean them as criticisms, like, you know, "That's that's not the right knife to cut the tomatoes, or why are you putting so much water in the, pot for the pasta. What's wrong with you? Um, We may be wanting to, you know, give our little helpful corrections and pay attention to how often you do that and get more bite marks on your tongue and dial it down and, um, you know, make sure to let your partner know what you appreciate about him. Because we stop doing that. We do it in the courtship stage of a relationship more frequently. That's when we let our partner know that, you know, that they're chosen and special and valued. And we pay attention to what we like in the early stages and we comment on that. And it's very interesting, though, because the longer a couple is together, the more that selective attention slips. And we automatically comment on what we're critical about and we don't like. And we automatically fail to comment on all the little things that we do like. Like, hey, I heard you talking to your brother on the phone and I was really impressed by how you use humor to sort of deal with him. So watch that ratio of positive to negative. And up, up the positive. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right in terms of kind of the ratio of women generally offering. Um, they would probably see it not as critique or criticism, but more like feedback, uh, positive reinforcement. But the truth is, is that often like the delivery of it can come across as, man, you're just really negative. Uh, and for a guy, that's you know you, you alluded to this, it sends them into the fight or flight or freeze mode in how they react. What would you say to women? Let's just let's just stay there for a moment because I think some of them might be asking the question, okay, I get that, that I need to have a five-to-one ratio, but quite honestly, how do I get through to him that he knows my frustration or that we're not connecting? What would you say are some rules that you've established that can help um, women and men really communicate through the not through criticism but through a different uh, channel of how they express their, their needs or frustrations? 
Well, if you're wanting to really get through to a partner and you want to have the very best chance of doing that, the first step is to dial down the criticism because um, your partner will shut down. You know, we're wired also for defensiveness. So if you approach a conversation with criticism or blame, then your partner is going to shut down. So timing and tact is really important if you're wanting to exceed your partner's threshold of, of deafness. And first, by the way, it is important to really warm things up if you want to be heard. So don't, don't forget about, about that, that your partner needs to feel valued and special or it will be impossible you know, for him to hear your legitimate complaints. The, the other thing is, in terms of getting through, is to not overload the circuits. Um, one thing I hear a lot from men is they just feel flooded. They feel flooded by the intensity of their wife's voice. They feel flooded by the, even by the number of words. So approach your partner not when you're feeling angry and intense. Approach your partner when you're actually feeling good about him. And then, you know, another, this is going to sound like a very silly little tip, but if you're wanting to talk about something that you suspect is going to be difficult and emotionally loaded, go to a new place. Don't open the conversation, you know, in your living room or kitchen or any place where you've had lots of fights. You know, go to a totally new venue. could be a coffee shop or a room you've never been. And open the conversation when you're feeling calm. Um, don't overload the circuits by going on for too long. And, and remember, anything that you want to say, no matter how critical, can be said respectfully and lovingly. So think about timing, you know, time that's good for you. Think about place. Think about tact. And although, again, this sounds silly, learn to say it shorter Mm -hmm. and to bring up one criticism at a time and, um, you know, the, that's what first comes to my mind wow. for some good communication rules. That's great. Well, let's talk about the couple who's just always fighting. I mean, they just seem like it just takes a little spark and they're off to the uh-huh. races. Uh-huh. <laughs> so what would you say to them? You know, how would you advise a couple who's are, are frequently fighting? I mean, I'm talking about, like, they keep running into the same issues and it seems to either they're the exploders or they're the imploders where they stuff it away and then all of a sudden it comes out at a different point. But really they're ones that are kind of in a defensive posture. You know, it's very important to understand that that couples fight, happy couples fight. And it's very easy in marriage for things to go from zero to 100 in five seconds. And let me give you an example from my own marriage that happened the other day. You know, any, and it doesn't even have to be about anything important. I'm going to tell you about our banana fight. So my husband, Steve, my husband of over 40 years, comes home the other day from shopping with five totally ripe bananas. And I immediately get reactive and demand an apology because there are only two of us in the house. We're not big banana eaters. We don't bake banana bread. And we've talked about this banana thing many times before. So I was already in a bad mood, and I was having a low esteem day. So I went, when Steve didn't apologize, you know, for his banana sin, I went at him like a trial attorney. Like, how can you buy five overripe bananas knowing three of them, you know, are going to get tossed? And what kind of person lets food rot in a world where people are going hungry, and then I concluded with uh, that most tactful of all statements, what's wrong with you? By the way, those are the four words guaranteed to drive any conversation downhill. 
So Steve gets defensive, surprise, surprise, and tells me I should do the shopping myself if I'm going to criticize how he does it. And then I argue and stomp off because why am I suddenly the bad guy? I would never buy five totally ripe bananas and bring them home. And, you know, it's, it's such a silly kind of thing, but that's how it goes. You know, here we are. We're two seemingly mature psychologists. And, you know, my point is that you're going to fight. And if you're anxious and intense and there's stress, you can get into chronic fighting. And what matters is to understand that it's normal and that a good, if your marriage has a solid friendship and mutual respect, it actually can tolerate a fair amount of fighting if, now here's the if, if you repair it. So nothing is more important than having one person um, in the marriage being able to calm down and say, you know, for example, I'm sorry, I was in a really, you know, I was in a really bad mood, and I apologize for my part in this. And then you need another person who is able to accept the olive branch. So you need someone who can offer the olive branch and make peace, and you need someone who can accept it rather than continuing, you know, to stonewall and refuse to talk to the other person. And accepting the olive branch, it doesn't mean you forgive. It doesn't mean that there's nothing more to talk about. But it means that you're willing to lower the intensity and be friends again, and you can open the conversation at another time. When fighting leads to um, divorce, chronic fighting, and erodes the very friendship, you know, the very foundation of a marriage, the problem is that someone is too locked in to their intensity to offer that olive branch or offer a peacemaking move and there's not another person with enough goodwill and maturity to accept it and maybe to continue the conversation a different time about what they're angry about. Yeah, no, that's really, I think it's really helpful to understand that that, you know, reconciliation, really what we're talking about is reconciliation after the conflict is based upon one person being willing to come with the olive branch and the other one to receive it, um, which is not easy. I mean, let's just be honest. I, I'm, I'm just curious, based on your story, who came with the olive branch first? Right. <laughs> right. I remember early in my marriage, you know, I wouldn't apologize because I was clear that I was only 47% to blame, you know, to blame, and he was more than 50% to blame. So he had to apologize first. And That's a great recipe for failure. Mm -hmm. I have a favorite story on this topic about their two little kids playing in the sandbox with their pails and shovels, and suddenly a big fight breaks out, and one kid starts screaming to the other, I hate you, I hate you. And five minutes later, they're back in the sandbox playing happily again. And two adults are sitting on the park bench watching this interaction. And one adult says to the other, how did these kids do it? Like they were total enemies five minutes ago. And the other adult says, it's simple. They choose happiness over righteousness. Mm. They choose happiness over being right. And it's really hard for adults to do that, you know, where... We dig in our heels and, you know, we're not going to we're not gonna take the first move if the other person doesn't admit that they started it and they're more wrong. And, of course, that is a recipe for unhappiness. Yeah. No, I love that. That's a great story. And I think, it can, I think a lot of folks can relate to that, especially those who have been married for some time. You realize, is this a, is this a battle worth dying for? You know, I mean, if, if, if we're going to... If we're going to get into that conflict and I'm going to, you know, 
make sure that I come out being right? Is it worth the amount of emotional toll that it's going to take on the relationship? And I think most come to a quick conclusion that the faster we can repair, the faster we can, you know, begin to um, strengthen and build build on uh, our relationship. And I just wonder if a lot of this has to do with in the communication, kind of coming back to communication, the ability for successful marriages in this process of, and I love how you said that, even good couples, they 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 have conflict, right? So it's not just, you know, it's, it's how you manage the conflict. I think one of the key ingredients to that is how do you become a better listener in the relationship? And maybe share with us some rules, marriage rules for being a better listener. Listening is so important. Listening is actually the greatest spiritual gift that we can give to our partner. And, you know, it's not a very sexy topic. No, I have to tell you that. I I used to give workshops on talking straight and fighting fair, and people were breaking down the doors to get into the workshop. And then I decided to give a workshop on listening, you know, and the power of open-hearted, non-defensive listening. And I had to cancel the workshop because no one, you know, like three people signed up. If only our wish to understand the other person were as great as our wish to be understood. Um, but really, we, want, we, we are very interested in the talking part. We're not so interested in the listening part. So first, realize how important it is to listen. And it's easy to listen if we like what our partner is saying. You know, they're saying how wonderful and handsome and, you know, clever we are. But it's really hard to listen when we don't want to hear what they're saying. For example, they're criticizing us. And we automatically listen defensively when we're being criticized. We automatically listen for the exaggerations, the distortions, the inaccuracies that will inevitably be there. And we can learn to listen differently. You can learn to sort of quiet your mind and go into the conversation telling yourself that you will only listen to understand. You will only listen for the part that you can agree with and that you can get that part and apologize for that part first. And that kind of non-defensive listening is really hard and you don't do it when you're feeling angry and intense. It's better to say, I really want to hear what you're saying. I'm not at a place I can listen now. Let's get together over coffee tomorrow, and I want to hear everything that you're, you know, that you want to tell me. Um, in other words, don't try to listen when you can't listen. Let your partner know that you really want to hear what she's saying, but not now. Or not in that way. For example, one thing, you know, that men have a hard time doing is saying something like, um, you know, what you're telling me, dear, is, is very important. But when you approach me in this intense, rat-a-tat way, I feel flooded and I can't listen and I need you to approach me calmly and with respect and let's set up another time when when you can do that so you can also tell the other person what you need to be able to listen better but i i can't stress enough what i um i I know i've said quite a bit here but that that listening is the ultimate spiritual act in a marriage And it takes practice to enter a conversation only to listen, ask questions, try to understand. And then in another conversation, you can bring up how you see things differently. Mm -hmm. In other words, we feel we have to do everything in one conversation. I advise you, here's a big challenge for 
listeners that the next time, you know, she says or he says, we have to talk, and you're all clutched, (laughs) and oh my God, um, think about having two conversations. And in the first one, you'll surprise your partner by only listening and really trying to get it and saying, do I have this right? And is there more you haven't told me? And then you can have a second conversation at a different time where you say, you know, I've been thinking about all your criticisms and I agree with what you said, A, B, and C, but I don't agree with with this. And let me tell you how I see it differently. And thinking in terms of two conversations like that, it sounds simple, but if any of you experiment with it, you'll see the courage and motivation it takes to just listen. No interrupting, no bringing up the other person's crime sheet, no coming to your own defense, no cutting the other person off, no correcting inaccuracies. There's a challenge for our listeners, for all of us. (laughs) Oh, yes. Uh, I would have to say that one of the things that we hear a lot of from, especially guys, I think, is that they'll start out this path of listening, and then what they inevitably run into is um, just the changing of topics. And it almost gets to the point where, you know, from one topic to the next, they're in between saying, wait, I've got to fix the last you know, topic that you were bringing up. And now you're moving on to another topic and you still want me to stay in the listening mode. So it's, this is not an easy, easy uh, place to, and I think, you know, vice versa. There's a, a lot of women go, you know, gosh, if I could just have him listen instead of try to solve my problems, that would be a winner. You know, that, that, would, that would be a game changer in our relationship. So I appreciate you sharing some of the, the you know, tactical, practical ways of just stepping into that place of listening for the purpose of understanding and not, you know, coming up with, you know, a defense or, you know, um, now there's so many other alternative motives that come up in this process of communication, which moves me to, uh, I think the next part of this, a lot of our listeners, you know, they, they struggle to stay deeply connected, especially within the military, uh, which is a big audience that we serve. What marriage rules do you recommend for staying connected? Well, we all want to stay deeply connected. And as I said before, it's not the normal state of things. The normal state of things is that you're, go- you're going to move in and out of connection and disconnection. You're going to move in and out of being your best self, you know, and then being a big jerk. But you want to be moving in the right direction. And I think moving in the direction of more connection has to do now with with the important things that we've been talking about. First of all, I agree with you. Don't wait. Don't wait till you're in a crisis or in great pain to experiment with new behaviors that will make your marriage better. Because it takes two to couple up, but it only takes one to make things a whole lot better. And to be deeply connected, it means you have to warm things up. It means you have to dial down the criticism. It means that you have to learn to really listen. It means that you learn to fight fair when you fight and to repair the disconnections. And... What's so hard about staying deeply connected is, like we said right up front, we we want our partner to change. And change will only occur when you change your own self. It doesn't matter if you're convinced your partner is 98% to blame. You can only change that to percent. So, for example, if you're the pursuer or the critical one, you can experiment with dialing that down. If you are the distancer and the stonewaller, you can experiment with moving toward your partner. If you overtalk things, you can experiment with saying it's shorter, much shorter, and with less intensity. 
if you under talk things, you know, you can push yourself to have a little more conversation. And these patterns are so entrenched. You know, the pursuer, the distancer, the overtalker, the undertalker. Um, if you want to be more deeply connected, you're the one that has to pick one or two marriage rules and put them in, into practice. And you know, so many people say to me, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to warm things up until he does X, Y, and Z. It's really when our partner is being the biggest jerk that we're called upon to be our very best self. So if you want to be connected, you need to be self-focused. And by self-focused, I don't mean self-blaming. Because I think that personal growth and working in your marriage is basically a self-loving task. And it doesn't flourish in an atmosphere of self-blame or other blame. So you need to be self-focused, meaning you're working on yourself and you're working on relationships outside of the marriage. Because if you're not working on friendships, on family relationships, on your own goals and what you want to pursue and develop uh, for your own self, you'll be over-focused on your partner in a critical, worried, or blaming way. And take it as a rule of physics that if you're real over-focused on your partner, you're probably under-focused on yourself. Yeah. No, that's so true. And I, I wonder if the, the power of empathy comes into this, you know, in being able to stay deeply connected, you know, the understanding of how, do I, how do I move into the shoes of my partner to understand what they're feeling right now. Uh, I know that there's been so much connected to that piece that oftentimes is missing in a couple who's highly devitalized de or conflicted is that they lose the ability to empathize. They might share sympathy, but there's quite a vast difference between the two. You know, in the progression of our conversation, I think it's interesting that we started with, you know, how do you begin to motivate change within yourself to communicate, to dealing with becoming a better listener, which all these topics, I think, bridge, they need to be there fundamentally before you move into my next question, which is, can you share with us some top marriage rules related to sex? Oh, my. So we're um, jumping right into the big one here. <laughs> <laughs> well, sex is um, very difficult for married people. You know, it's interesting because I think that it's the rules on sex are titled, you know, that chapter is titled, Forget About Normal Sex. Because in marriage, what I see most frequently happens in, with sex is that very often there's one pursuer and there's one distancer. Mm -hmm. There's one yes partner and there's another partner who has no interest um, in sex at all. So again, there's only one way to break that cycle which is the pursuer has to experiment with stop pursuing for sex and the distancer has to stop distancing. And it's as simple and as difficult as that. For example, you want an example? Yes, please. Okay. So if you're the pursuer, usually but not always the man, um, you need to understand that nothing is going to change if you just keep pursuing and then you go into periods of cold, angry withdrawal. You have to stop pursuing. And that means you have to put all your anger and hurt and frustration on a shelf and say something like this to your partner at a calm time. You have a very brief conversation and you say something like, you know, I really hope that you'll initiate sex at some point um, because I can't imagine living forever without it, but I really want to take all the pressure off you because it hasn't helped either of us 
And if you're in the mood for a hug and a kiss and a back rub, let me know. And I promise that that will do these things without my pushing for anything else. The pressure is off. And keep that talk light and brief and try to maintain that for two weeks, say. And if you're the distancer and you have, you know, a decent, respectful partner, initiate sex once in a while, even though you don't feel like it. Because if you have a partner for whom sex is important and it's an enlivening essential force and it's a means of connection, your partner can't live forever in a sex, you know, sexless marriage. And to decide that you simply won't be a physical partner because you don't feel like it, it's like his deciding that there's not going to be any more conversation in the marriage because he's not a talker. So probably if you're the distancer, there's probably something you can do that wouldn't be too terribly difficult. And, you know, this changing this pattern for a distancer to stop distancing and for a pursuer to stop pursuing and, and by that, I don't mean coldly withdrawing. I mean staying warm and attentive, but stopping the pursuit. It, I think it's one of the hardest rules in marriage rules. And my saying this probably would leave both partners feeling, I just can't do that. You know, I, I can't make this change. And if you truly believe your relationship is sustainable as a platonic friendship over decades to come, you can forget about my rules um, under the sex chapter in marriage rules, but if you know in your heart that some sort of sex life is necessary for your relationship to survive over time, then, then you need to um, break this, this cycle and you know, run with the rules in my forget about normal sex chapter. Hmm. Yeah, you know, this is one of those topics that I think um, there's a lot of confusion and there can oftentimes be a lot of pain that's associated to it. And generally, like you said, there's, yeah. the, you know, there's the pursuer and then the avoider and that oftentimes is linked to um, desire level within the equation of sex. And I think what you're saying is oftentimes those roles can be reversed. Uh, it doesn't have to be the man who's high desire and the woman's low desire but at the end of the day, I think there's this, there's, the more they're intentional about uh, working on their relationship outside the bedroom, the better it's going to be inside the bedroom. I think the correlation between that, many, many couples um, think that, you know, sex for a married couple creates intimacy and it's really, intimacy is created by what's already happening in the relationship. Um, and so being able to apply some of these rules are really, really important. But I think we also just recognize that this is not often an easy topic, especially if there's been a lot of pain um, or there's maybe been a lot of distancing uh, in the relationship that takes place. So um, appreciate you sharing that. It's a terribly vulnerable topic, Noel, and I want to um, comment on what you're saying because it's both true and not true. Um, it's, It's true that if you are a partner who is not respectful um, who is rude and distant, etc., then it's very likely that your partner is not going to, you know, want to have sex with you. That's true. Here's the thing. We know now that there are many marriages that are really good marriages that don't have good sex. There's one or both partners who don't want sex. So you can have a wonderful friendship in your marriage and a a good marriage and still things don't go well sex-wise. And sometimes because of that, sex needs you to, you know, push yourself, you know, to push yourself again to, if you're the pursuer, to back off. If you don't want sex, try to initiate it anyway, 
because you can love your partner very much and and still not want sex. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I think that's I, I love it. I know we've interviewed Michelle Weiner Davis, and she I love one of her lines that for the one who's you know the distancer or not really interested in sex, she said, you know, you got to adopt the philosophy of Nike, and that is just do it. You can't wait for the emotion to be there, the mood to be there. Um, you know, she said, how many countless times has you know, that that individual said once we're having sex, their 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 thought is, why don't we do this more often? And it's just having to mm-hmm. you know push through that barrier to say, I'm going to do it even though I don't feel like it or I'm not in the mood for it. So I think that definitely resonates with a lot of our listeners. It's, but it's 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 a it's a, a topic that you know I think um, has to be handled with care because both sides can see them, themselves in this is what I'm not getting or this is where I feel pressure and how do you work through that? How do you navigate that? I think is really what we're talking about is mm-hmm. what does that look like? And uh, sometimes it's having to be a little bit uncomfortable on both sides, right? In terms of what we would want it to be. Right. And of course, couples do better in bed and out of bed too when, when they can lighten up and not take things so personally and, you know, just have a spirit of adventure or experimentation. And um, but yeah, easier easier said than done. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing. And uh, I guess what I'd just leave with our listeners: is there any other advice or marriage rules that you feel like are really important for them to know? I think now that we've covered the <laughs> most important, just to run through them to warm things up, to dial down the criticism, to Stop the emotional pursuit. I mean, it never helps to pursue a distancer, to say it shorter. Um, One we didn't talk about is to know your bottom line in marriage. And what I mean by that is marriage requires a tremendous respect for differences. You know, we, we're all different. We see the world through a different filter. We have different ways of managing our anxiety. And differences don't mean one person is right and the other person is wrong. And I have a favorite cartoon that I have in my consulting room. And it shows a dog and a cat in bed together. And the dog is looking morose and reading a book called Dogs Who Love Too Much. And the cat is saying, I'm not distancing. I'm a cat, damn it. <laughs> and I love that cartoon because we, we really do need to lighten up about, about differences. But we also need, and this is one we didn't talk about, to know our bottom line. Because it's important to be flexible with our partner, say, 90% of the time. But it's important that we don't sacrifice our core beliefs and values under relationship pressures. So a marriage will spiral down if you have an anything-goes policy. Mm. So a bottom line means that you can take a position when it really matters, and you can take a position and mean it. For example, I, I gave, you know, actually I gave an example of a bottom line position without um, calling it such earlier, that you could say to your partner, you know, I'm here to listen to anything you have to say, but you need to approach me respectfully um, and not, you know, with name calling and not rudely so that I can't be in this conversation until you approach me differently. That's an example of a bottom line position. And um, so I would say that that combination of respecting differences and, and, you know, not getting reactive at every little thing and being flexible, but when it really matters, you know, that you can stand like an oak, um, that's very important in marriage, both of those things. Yeah, no, that's so good. And I think that's a great 
note to end on here, and what we've been talking about is marriage rules, a manual for married and the coupled up. And uh, Harriet, thank you so much for the work that you've contributed and the countless marriages that you've helped. I know that you have a book that's coming out here fairly soon. Uh -huh. It's called Why Won't You Apologize? Healing Big Betrayals and Everyday Hurts. Uh, and what, what's the day that that's coming out? Why Won't You Apologize is coming out early January, although it can be pre-ordered now on Amazon. And it so ties into all we've been talking about because we're always going to be both the party that hurts, you yeah. know, someone, yep. and we're also going to be the hurt party who isn't getting the apology that we really need and deserve. And we're such imperfect human beings. I mean, all of us are imperfect human beings, so we're always going to be on both sides of the equation, you know, the offender Absolutely. and the offended, especially yes. in marriage and family life. So it ties in very much, why won't you apologize, ties in very much. And I've been interested over a couple of decades in understanding why some people can't apologize, can't or won't. So I talk about that also in the book. Well, that is an important topic, and I'll tell you, out of the thousands of couples that we work with each year, forgiveness and the ability to ask for forgiveness and receive forgiveness is critical for couples to you know, be able to continue to be healthy in their relationship. So I can, we, we look forward to having that out. We'll be linking both of these books below the video, and Harriet, thank you so much for being on the show. Mm -hmm.